of the Kennedy School and on behalf of the Center for Public Leadership uh, for our guest. And uh, I think all of you have come first and foremost because we're just so thrilled uh, that you're here, Shirley Ann Jackson. You're, you're, uh, you, you're, you're, I don't know how quite how you managed it, uh, but to have the New York Times feature you on the day of your arrival <laughs> is something that all of us appreciate uh, very much. I'm going to leave it to my good colleague Todd Patinsky to do the more formal introductions here today uh, and on his co-sponsors and everyone else. But I wanted to take a word, a moment, just to uh, uh, say a personal thank you Shirley, for coming and also to, once again, say how much we at Kennedy School have appreciated the members of the Women's Leadership Board uh, who are in attendance, many of them here. They, they, they arrived on Thursday and many of them are still here and I understand it's been a bang up weekend. And terrific, Susan Ray has been all smile, read the smiles today. Uh, but uh, you all have contributed in such so many ways to this institution. Uh, we've been deeply indebted to you for that and we're looking forward to uh, an ever uh, a growing relationship because your mission is our mission and it's something we would like to do uh, in partnership with you. So thank you again, but I want now to introduce uh, Todd Kuczynski, who has become a rising star on this faculty uh, and uh, is someone who has contributed enormously to thinking about diversity and leadership uh, and is a uh, freshly admitted new PhD who is just, is, is just showing us the way. So Todd, thank you so much. By way of introduction, um, we're going to move at a fairly fast clip um, to afford as much time for the, the dialogue as possible. I do, before we start, want to do um, two things. One is to share with you why we're so excited um, that Dr. Jackson joined us today, and then also just to recognize our co-sponsors. So um, I have to share with you each, uh, I'm an assistant professor on faculty, and one of the things that I help the center uh, for public leadership with is thinking about who would be people who can we can bring into the school um, to enrich our conversation around leadership. Um, this beginning of the year, I generated a short list um, of folks who I think would be just terrific. Um, and then I take that list and I vet it with students and say, well, geez, you know, students, who would you like to come in? And we had one person who was at the top of the original list that we generated and then the list that the students came back and generated. And we are very honored and, and grateful um, to have that person with us here today as our main course for lunch. <laughs> the, 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 the second piece, um, that, or the second reason we're so excited is that one of the goals of the center is to really think about leadership across sectors of society. And we really need to be moving the conversation, not just to one central place, but building bridges with communities like the science community so we think about it in a richer and deeper way. And there was really no one person that we could have identified or hoped to hear from who, in a, in a richer way, could have helped us think about how to move science in a way um, that is truly about leadership and society and science in the public interest. So um, for those two reasons, we're extremely, extremely uh, excited and grateful. We have a bunch of co-sponsors, and I just want to highlight them. Um, the co-sponsors help us to bring folks like you in. Um, we have Alana, which is a student group. It's, uh, Alana stands for African American, Latino, Asian, Pacific American, Native American, and Allies. It's a very vibrant student group on campus. Um, we have the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, who's co-sponsoring today's lunch. We have the KSG Black Student Caucus. We have the Women's Leadership Board, which David mentioned. And then I also want to note um, Connie Jensen, who's a staffer at the Center for Public Leadership, who actually, when we first cooked up um, the idea of having the audacity to invite you, um, found your uh, APS article um, about science and, and leadership. And it was really a wonderful first piece for people to begin to get their arms around some of the issues. So thank you, Connie. Um, in terms of your bio, um, it's, a, it's a challenge to introduce uh, Dr. Professor, President Jackson, and to, to step up, we have um, Ash Carter. For those of you who know, Professor Carter is the Ford Foundation Professor of Science and International Affairs at the school, member of the board for our Belfer Center, and co-director of a project, uh, the Preventive Defense Project, which is a joint project at the Kennedy School and uh, Stanford University. So thank you, Professor Carter. Thank you, Professor uh, 
Kaczynski. Uh, I'm here because um, I'm a physicist, and um, I'll tell you in a minute how I first knew uh, and saw Shirley Jackson and know a little something about what she's going to uh, uh, talk about. So let me give you a preview of why this is important. You know, in the presidential campaign, there's a uh, debate about outsourcing and whether <clears throat> the fact that software engineering is being done by Indians in Bangalore rather than by Americans in California is a matter of concern or not. And the economists all tell you, well, this is good, this is efficient. If they're better at it, then they ought to be doing it. And if we're not as good at it, then we ought not to do it, uh, which makes perfect sense uh, as well. But like most things economists say, you, it always leaves you scratching your head a little bit because it doesn't quite answer the next question, which is, well, OK, if they're better at that than we are, what are we good at? Because after all, we have to make a living too. And the American way of making a living has always been to be at the next frontier. And in general, those frontiers, those the next thing economically, has been defined by science and technology. And so we have gotten to the next best thing by being good at science and technology. And what uh, our speaker is going to discuss today, and which, by the way, if you haven't seen the New York Times today, is uh, the theme of the story in which she uh, appears. The question she's going to be uh, asking is, are we, as a society now, the United States, uh, today compared to, let's say, 30 years ago when the seeds of today's prosperity were being planted, are we planting comparable seeds today? Or is everybody else getting educated in science and technology? Is everybody else winning the Nobel Prizes and so forth? And we're not. Now, this is a tricky thing to measure, as I'm sure she'll suggest, because human inspiration and brilliance and ideas, which is what we're looking for out of science and technology, is not something that is easy to measure. So you can't just measure it by measuring how many bodies you have with PhDs, because maybe not all of them are very creative, and so forth. And so it's a difficult thing to measure. Uh, but measure it we must, or assess it we must, because otherwise you wonder where, what we'll be doing as a society 30 years um, from now. On top of which, of course, making money isn't everything. It would be nice to have a culture as well, and human progress, and deeper understanding, and these are all good things to be doing too. So no topic, in a sense, strategically for the long term of greater moment for public policy in the United States than whether we're going to be part of the future in some fundamental way. That's the subject that Shirley's going to speak about. I told you that um, you know, I, I'm here because I can relate to her field uh, a little bit. We both were at Fermilab in the heyday of Fermilab. Fermilab's that big ring outside of Chicago, like 40 miles west. You have to go all the way in to get a good meal. Uh, <clears throat> that has the buffalo in the middle and was the first place where uh, very high energy proton beams were, were uh, accelerated. Um, from there, Shirley went to Bell Telephone Laboratories, the premier uh, industrial laboratory in history, uh, and to the, well, I think it's fair to say, the best Department of Theoretical uh, Solid State Physics that existed in the world at that time. Uh, she worked uh, there. Uh, I saw her also when I was in the Department of Defense in the Clinton administration, Assistant Secretary of Defense, and she was in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and we were worried about things like loose nukes in the former Soviet Union as it collapsed. Um, she is a scholar, an academic administrator of the highest distinction, particularly in her position now as president of RPI. Uh, a national leader, president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, and uh, a distinguished public servant in her service to the country in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So she has it all, but she's got a whale of a topic uh, for us. Nothing more important, nothing to get your, harder to get your hands around. And if there's anybody who can do it, really, it's you. And, uh, Uh, thank you. I want to thank all of you for your very uh, 
kind opening remarks, and I would like to uh, thank the Center for Public Leadership and all of the co-sponsors for inviting me to speak today on a topic that I believe to be vital to our nation, our economy, our security, our global leadership. <coughs> all embodied in a question, which is how can we ensure and sustain our national capacity for innovation? Now as a nation, uh, we are in the midst of two struggles. One is an international struggle against terrorism, which most see as an acute threat. The other is a struggle for sustaining our national science and technology capacity. And while we are fully engaged in the one, we have been ignoring the other, which is directly related and ultimately may prove to be the greater. Now this is not a new issue. In February of 2001, the U.S. Commission on National Security in the 21st Century, often called the hart rutman Commission, released the third of its reports entitled Roadmap for National Security and Imperative for Change. It made five recommendations. The first was ensuring the security of the American homeland. The second was, and I quote, recapitalizing America's strengths in science and education, end of quote. Now, expanding on this recommendation, the commission said that while we have enjoyed the economic and security benefits of previous investments in science and education, we have now crossed a line and are consuming capital. That means, among other things, that the nation has seriously underinvested in basic research. The commission states that as science and education fall behind other nations' investments, this poses, and again to quote, a greater threat to U.S. national security over the next quarter century than any potential conventional war that we might imagine. Now, in discussing the national challenges we face, I will make three key points. I learned this from giving physics talks. You tell them, the end, you tell them all through, and you tell them at the end. And one is the criticality of investment in basic research. A second is the urgent need for human development, the need to invest in human resources, the talent pool to ensure that we have sufficient future scientists and engineers to do the research. A third is a charge, actually, even though I'm doing it here, to the scientific community itself, to engage its leadership and input on knife edge issues, that is, issues which sit at the nexus of science, technology, and public policy. Scientific discovery and technological innovation have driven economies for centuries. In recent decades, it has fueled our economic prosperity and is the primary source of our global leadership. I just ask you to consider for a moment air transportation, atomic energy, jet and rocket propulsion, space technologies, communications, televisions, electronic computers, semiconductors, <coughs> microchips, laser optics, fiber optics, holograms. Developments which have revolutionized life today have spawned new in industries and have provided the underpinning of our economy and global preeminence. These developments did not self-generate. They did not spring into being of themselves. They are the direct result of funded research in science and engineering. But scientific and technological progress is not inevitable. It is not self-perpetuating. Its momentum must be sustained by a steady infusion of talent and of resources. This then requires attention, cognizance, and investment. Now, history de demonstrates that we do not know where the most significant future breakthroughs will occur, even when technological applications for innovations appear obvious. When the transistor was invented in 1947, the New York Times, that we've been referring to today, reported only that the device might lead to better hearing aids. Now, if it had led to better hearing, it might not be so bad, but better hearing aids. Now, instead, or beyond that, transistors are essential to almost every system or device manufactured today. Computers, cameras, cars, spacecraft, missiles, and more. These achievements themselves were driven by the rise of computer science and greater computational capability brought about by the marriage of quantum science and microfabrication techniques. 
to develop microprocessors, nanoscale devices, integrated circuits, and more. Now, these advances resulted from the nation's investment in basic research and the compact, the compact between the federal government and research universities dating back to the post-World War II period and to Vannevar Bush's case for this coupling, which he laid out in Science, the Endless Frontier. By almost any measure, generous funding for scientific research is a profitable long-term investment. A report issued last fall by the National Research Council identifies 10 separate areas within information technology alone, where federal research funding since the 1960s has played an invaluable role in the creation of products that now command multi-billion dollar markets, including, of course, the internet, client server networks, computer graphics, just to name a few. But we have reached a critical juncture with regard to our support of basic research in the sciences. The war on terror, the uneven economic expansion of the last three years, and the budget deficit have weakened government resolve to invest in basic research. And this is happening just when we should be investing more, not less, in basic research in science and engineering. As the lesson of the transistor shows, the scientific breakthroughs of the day become the transformative technologies of tomorrow. The resulting economic growth always repays the investment many times over. Moreover, broad funding is important because science and, in and engineering have become multidisciplinary. Contemporary research <laughs> leaps traditional boundaries as once distinct disciplines necessarily inform each other in order to achieve new breakthroughs. Moreover, as interdisciplinary teams collaborate on an issue, it is less likely that a line of research will end in a scientific cul-de-sac, and more probable that it will open up new avenues to explore. <coughs> Consider the following. If someone asks you to design more effective and more sturdy armor for soldiers, would you begin, <coughs> would you begin by studying the manipulation of matter at the molecular level? Probably not. And yet researchers in nanotechnology, which is the practice of manipulating matter at the atomic or molecular level, have made great strides toward developing strong protective clothing for soldiers in the form of dynamic armor, which can be activated quickly on the battlefield. Now, the possible military and security applications of nanotechnology also include new medical treatments, which could make battlefield medicine more swift and more effective and create nanoscale sensors for detecting chemical and biological attacks. Already scientists at the Johns Hopkins University have developed a self-assembling protein gel which can stimulate biological signals to quicken the growth of cells. And using a combination of actual human cells, engineered materials, and biochemical factors, the gel can actually replace, repair, or regenerate damaged tissue. Now, indeed, nanotechnology has quickly become a quintessentially multidisciplinary field with a, with a wide variety of promising applications resulting from fundamental research in this area. For instance, material scientists have already found ways to integrate nanomaterials into everyday products, which can be found in everything from automobiles to eyeglasses, paint, and sunscreen. Engineers have developed nano-thin magnetic materials, which enhance computer hard drive memory. Carbon nanotubes, a remarkable all-purpose structure, can strengthen materials or can function as metals or as semiconductors. Medical researchers are working on nanoscale methods of drug delivery as well as therapeutic technologies. But we have only seen the tip of the nanotechnology iceberg, but we can be confident that new advances will continue to come. Disciplinary walls also have tumbled in medicine. And it, it, it's been interesting. I'm, you know, Rensselaer does not have a medical school, but I am on the board of uh, Georgetown University and as well Rockefeller. And it's amazing how disciplinary they really are. But disciplinary walls are starting to crumble in medicine where physicists continue to develop new sophisticated MRI technologies, informing doctors about the body's internal organs. 
And recently, researchers at Duke and here at Harvard have developed methods of making MRI movies, which can be used to produce sequential images of blood moving through vessels and air moving through the lungs. To develop these techniques, physicists with years of study in the properties of gases and liquids have collaborated extensively with medical researchers and doctors at both of these research universities to produce tools that required both conceptual leaps and extensive refinement. Thanks to breakthroughs like these, doctors can make better diagnoses using safer, non-invasive tools. And in an area close to my heart, there are roughly 10 to 20 million nuclear medicine imaging and therapeutic procedures used in the United States annually. <coughs> nuclear byproduct material is used in radiopharmaceuticals, imaging devices, surgery devices, and teletherapy devices. Radioisotopes identify drug-resistant diseases, while radiation sterilizes tissues to aid in healing serious injury. And these tools are offshoots of basic research in the physical sciences conducted primarily without specific medical applications in mind. Transformative technologies, then, do not come with instruction books for use. We rely on the energy and the creativity of scientists in both the public and the private sectors to develop the tools and applications which change our world. So sustaining our national capacity for innovation means preparing the ground for the next transformative technology by investing in research and in the talent to make that happen. As unexpected as some new technologies may be, however, there are moments when certain fields seem ripe for innovation. In the 1960s, for instance, computer scientists did not necessarily envision the laptop, but they understood clearly the enormous room for advances in their field. The same may now be said of new alternative energy sources. <coughs> Fuel cell technology it does hold great promise. Hydrogen-powered fuel cell cars would reduce our dependence on oil and gas and the emissions <coughs> which contribute to global warming. There are, however, significant technology and infrastructure and policy barriers to be hurdled. On the technology <coughs> side, production of pure hydrogen in itself must become both cheaper and more environmentally sound to make hydrogen-powered fuel cells economically feasible. This work, too is multidisciplinary, involving fields from chemical engineering to the life sciences, and involve several new production techniques, such as splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen using solar or wind power, or reacting steam and methane at high temperatures in natural gas power plants. Any or all of these methods may prove to be useful, but we have to develop practical technologies which store, transport, and distribute hydrogen safely. Now there has been a recommitment to move ahead with hydrogen fuel cell development, but this is but a simple, not so simple, single <coughs> example of future technology. In the long run then, the innovations derived from nanotechnology, from medical diagnostics, and alternative fuels may be incidental to the original inquiry, but they will not be accidental. We cannot predict the technological transformations of the future, but we can expect. This then naturally <coughs> raises the following question, because this does not, it's not self-generating. Who will do the science in the 21st century? Now, a variety of converging demographic and social factors are creating circumstances which may preclude or compromise an answer to this question. Now, I liken the emerging situation to the perfect <coughs> storm. So allow me to develop the metaphor, if I may. Here in Massachusetts, of course, the phrase, the perfect storm, is associated with meteorological events of October 1991. In that year, a powerful weather system gathered force and ravaging the Atlantic Ocean over the course of several days caused the deaths of several Massachusetts-based <coughs> park fishermen and billions of dollars of damage. The event became a book and later a movie. Meteorolo meteorologists observing the event emphasized its freak nature, essentially the unlikely confluence of conditions which engendered the perfect storm. A cold front moving east, 
containing a short wave trough, or the initial conditions necessary for bad weather, collided with a low pressure system over the ocean as it also mixed with a high pressure system from Canada. These factors alone would have created a tempest, but at the same time, leftover portions of Hurricane Grace moved into the area, feeding the system, and creating an explosive weather event unlike anything witnessed <coughs> for decades. Now, these sorts of things do not happen often, but as I well learned from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, it's not just probability, it's consequence. And the salient point is this. The storm constituted a worst case scenario in which multiple factors converged to bring about an event of devastating magnitude. Now, having served in leadership positions in government and higher education and the corporate sector, one of my deepest concerns is that a similarly un unfortunate confluence of circumstances could arrest the progress of our national scientific and technological movement. The forces at work are multiple, and they are complex. They are demographic, political, social, economic, cultural. You know, the science and engineering workforce of the United States is aging. I'm one of those. Ash looks better than I do, but I'm one of them. Half of our Half of our engineers and scientists are at least 40 years old. And the average age of workers with science and engineering degrees is rising. And as a recent National Science Foundation survey states, the total number of retirements among science and engineering degree workers will dramatically increase over the next 20 years. This may be particularly true, this is still part of the quote, for PhD holders because of the steepness of their age profile. An older workforce is one factor. World events, including the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, and the resulting adjustments in federal immigration policy create another. Since 2001, visa applications to the United States have declined, and the number of international students and scientists coming to the US to study and to work has rapidly diminished. A recent survey by the Council of Graduate Schools has shown that 90% of American colleges and universities have seen a drop in overseas applications for fall 2004, 90%. The overall number is 32% lower than the year before. Indeed, 31 of 32 graduate schools with the largest international enrollments saw their overseas applications fall. The reduction is greatest in engineering and physical science programs. Faced with newer hurdles to obtaining U.S. visas, students from other nations are choosing to study elsewhere. But in addition, improving global economies are offering young scientists more job options at home and at places outside the United States. So fewer of them are coming here or staying here for employment after they graduate from U.S. universities. Now for yet another fact, fewer young Americans are studying science and engineering. In universities, graduate enrollment in science and engineering programs, having grown for decades, reached a peak in 1993, and despite some recent progress, remains below the level of a decade ago. By contrast, other nations, including developing nations, are harvesting the fruits of long-term concerted efforts to increase their, their domestic participation in science and engineering programs at the university level. According to a National Science Foundation study, 2.6 million first university degrees in science and engineering were granted worldwide in the most recent academic year for which data is available. Of those, 1.1 million were earned by Asian students in Asian universities, while 800,000 were generated in Europe and 600,000 in the United States. In engineering specifically, universities in Asian countries now produce six times as many bachelor's degrees as their counterparts in the United States. <laughs> Moreover, the proportional emphasis on science and engineering is greater in other nations than in the United States. Science and engineering degrees now represent 73% of all bachelor's degrees earned in China. 
Now I'm not saying we ought to have 73% of our degrees uh, in engineering, but it's an interesting statistic. 45% in South Korea and 40% in Taiwan. By contrast, the percentage of those taking a bachelor's degree in science and engineering in the, U the United States has remained steady at roughly 33% for the last three decades. Individually, any one of these four factors, an aging workforce, fewer international students, more opportunities around the globe, and the lack of interest, and I have to say performance, in science and math among U.S. students would be problematic. In combination, they could be devastating. And the United States could find itself falling well behind other nations for the first time in more than a century. Here, too, I am not, I'm not talking about jobs per se, but national capacity. Capacity for scientific discovery, innovation, and economic development. To be honest with you, already, on the basis of certain factors, factors that were discussed even in the New York Times article this morning, such as uh, refereed scientific publications, uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, intellectual property as measured by patents and important patents in key technologies, patents that our own industry uses, we're beginning to lag behind. Uh, Twenty years ago, 61% of the uh, peer-reviewed uh, journal articles were written here. Today, the number is 29%. But all is not lost, because the perfect storm need not unfold if we draw upon the talent extant in our youth and in youth who have traditionally been underrepresented in science, engineering, mathematics, and technology. This actually means reaching out to minority youth and to young women who now comprise but a small portion of our scientists and engineers, yet in sheer numbers together comprise what I have been calling, been calling the new majority, or rather the underrepresented majority. Consider the new demographics. In the last decade, the population of the United States grew from 249 million to 281 million. The non-Hispanic white population grew by roughly 3%, while the Hispanic or Latino population expanded by 58%, the Asian American population by 52%, and the African American population by 16%. The total minority population of the United States now is over 30%, when all young women as well are added to the mix the new majority emerges, the underrepresented majority. Now consider the demographics of higher education. By 2015, the nation's undergraduate population will have grown by 2.6 million, with more than 2 million of those students being people of color. By 2010, more women than men will earn degrees at each stage of higher education, from associate degrees to PhDs. By contrast, the traditional science, mathematics, engineering, and technology workforce today is still nearly 82% white and 75% male. So clearly there is a large demographic disparity between the scientific and technological workforce of the present and the general college-educated population of the future. Now we have made some progress, but there's still a long way to go because women still account for only 20% of college graduates who major in engineering. At the PhD level, women are only 17% of those receiving an engineering degree, and only 24% of those receiving a degree in mathematics and computer science. This is well short of the level of participation we need in order to replace those who are retiring from our scientific workforce. Now, we can arrest the perfect storm. But to do so, we need a full-fledged national commitment to identify, nurture, mentor, and to support the talent that resides in all of our population. But that then means the talent in the new majority. Now, on the surface, last year's Supreme Court decision involving the University of Michigan 
reaffirmed our nation's commitment to admissions policies that encourage diversity. But how do we, in fact, encourage talented students to commit themselves to the sciences as early as junior high school to stay the often difficult course through high school? You know, you really cannot do uh, differential equations and complex variable theory, which physicists do, if you can't do calculus. And you can't do calculus if you can't do geometry, algebra, and trigonometry. And you can't do algebra, geometry, and trigonometry if you cannot add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And because mathematics in particular is cumulative, and one of the key sort factors for those who would be physicists is in fact mathematics. So how do we encourage talented young students to commit themselves to the sciences as early as junior high school and to persist through high school? to find the means to attend the university and to continue through postgraduate work, to transition into the workplace, whether they work in a laboratory, a design studio, or in science, technology, and public policy. Now, some incentives necessarily must be financial. Now, President Bush recently voiced his approval for Pell Grants that especially aid low-income students entering the sciences. I would welcome an even more complete extension of this approach. This would require more economic support for such students. I think I did a calculation that it worked out to something like a couple of thousand per student. So this would require more economic support for such students, but also support for a broader socioeconomic range of students of all ethnic backgrounds and at all educational levels through graduate school. And an example, and one that I think originated with uh, some of your folks here, could be patterned on portable NDEA-like fellowships. These are National Defense Education Act fellowships that supported people like me to go to graduate school. But portable NDEA-like fellowships for graduate study in science and engineering is what one example. Other initiatives must be social and cultural. We must make the university a place where minority youth and women are welcome not just as students, but as faculty, made to feel comfortable and are encouraged through their studies to degree completion in science and engineering. I must commend uh, the Kennedy School, actually, for its statistics with regard to women in particular. And some universities or groups of universities have accomplished the student-focused um, approach through impressive summer preparatory and residence programs, as well as scholarships, loans, and fellowships aimed specifically at minorities and women, although I have to tell you, in talking with my fellow presidents, people are getting scared these days, having had the University of Michigan decisions. Now, I recently led one of three Blue Ribbon panels organized by an initiative of the Council on Competitiveness, of which I'm a member, and it, which is supported by the National Science Foundation. It's called BEST, Building Engineering and Science Talent. While evaluating programs and intended to bring minorities and women into the sciences, we observe that successful ones have certain common elements, and they are institutional leadership, leadership at the very top, targeted recruitment, engaged faculty, personal attention, peer support, comprehensive financial assistance, enriched and early research opportunities, programs that bridge to the next level for the connectivity, and of course, continuous program evaluation that you accomplish what you say you're going to accomplish. Encouraging new talent in science and engineering also will require finding new ways to teach young people. We must educate our students to work between disciplines, to reach new innovative aspects of science, engineering, and technology. We have to examine pedagogical approaches and learning styles. We must understand the cognition patterns of students who grew up on VCRs, MTV, video games, and instant learning, <coughs> and devise ways of organizing pedagogy to enable them to use their skills and perspectives in yet more creative ways. Information technology can take us beyond classroom walls, offering students the kind of interactive, experiential learning to which they have become habituated in ways which enhance their cognition, their analytical abilities, and their specific knowledge. Simulation of physical phenomena, gaming technology, 
telepresence and teleimmersion, the ability of geographically dispersed sites to collaborate in real time, are all pedagogical tools that can help us in this task. The diversity of the new majority is more important than one might realize. Not only because this is where the talent of the future lies, but this diversity is an unrealized treasure and a valuable asset in and of itself. But there's a hidden diversity as well across all of our students having to do with the diversity of how they think of their learning styles and their approach to solving problems. Now, it is no accident that for perhaps 150 to 200 years, the United States has been a global leader or that this nation has been the source of so much that is visionary, transformative, and new. Immigrants, new Americans, coming for decades to our shores from all parts of the globe brought, and I have to say still do bring with them, a unique determination to improve their lives and an eagerness to participate and to contribute. Here, they have pooled their vastly differing talents, their wide experience, the unique ideas, differing perspectives, and distinct cultures. This diverse mix, this great smelting pot, if you will, has been the crucible from which has poured a great array of world-changing discoveries, innovative technologies, life-sustaining initiatives, transformative ideas. A profitable alloying does not occur in isolation, however. Valuing diversity is a requirement. Corporate America already has embraced diversity as an essential asset, not only as good business and a competitive global marketplace, but also to produce the vanguard of creative ideas and innovative discoveries they must have to remain competitive. To attract all the talent, we must engage the new majority talent. We cannot ignore two-thirds of the population. We have to engage their interest in science and technology studies. Again, foster them through secondary school preparative classes. Support their advanced studies at the post-secondary level and mentor them through transition into careers. All that I have described requires bold leadership. Leadership to invest in basic research and human development, but as well, leadership on the knife edge where science, technology, and public policy come together. Let me give you one brief example, although I could cite many. How many of you have heard of Fusion? Great. Fusion is actually a groundbreaking AIDS HIV drug, which received FDA approval approximately two years ago. It was the first AIDS HIV drug approved in almost nine years. Fusion inhibits the ability of the HIV virus to fuse to cells of the immune system, thereby helping to restore the patient's natural defenses against the disease. It shows promise in helping patients to overcome resistance to many of today's more commonly used antiretroviral drugs. But AIDS patients and their advocates point out that Fusion will cost just under $20,000 per year, putting it out of the reach of many. Conventional treatments cost today $7,000 to $12,000 annually. Now, the prohibitive costs of funding and exploiting <clears throat> pharmaceutical research and development is a key aspect of this issue. Development of a new drug in the year 2000 cost in the neighborhood of $800 million. Does patent protection yield the best way to fund research and development or to get the best drug? Should government policy regulate the cost of pharmaceuticals, and if so, how? and to what extent? Or is there too much regulation already? The scientific community, I believe, must actually take a stronger hand in formulating policy, or at least informing the formulation of policy in such areas. We cannot just advocate for the support of science itself. We also must articulate and help to resolve the knife edge issues. We must bring balance to the debate, and we must advocate the role of science and of the scientific community in addressing the issues inside the community of science and outside. The aspect of leadership which is becoming increasingly critical is communication to inform both the public 
and public policy. We live in the information glut era, where vast amounts of information, some credible, much not, <coughs> are available at a click to everyone. But internet search engines do not come with credibility filters, which can leave the public confused and unenlightened. The resultant sense of disquiet about science and where it can lead suggests that scientists must redouble their efforts to lead and to inform public policy and the public. This will of necessity be both personal and collective leadership. Public policy is not always, and I don't have to tell you this, perhaps is not often in the minds of some an ideal forum for fair debate. It is a roiling marketplace where every voice has its own agenda and where an issue can become veiled and confused. But it is a public marketplace of ideas. It is democratic and it is open. The public policy arena needs the reasoned voice of science itself. Scientists who have no economic interest in the outcome of the decision. Scientific organizations that can use their credibility to inform public policy debates, weighing in on knife edge issues with a voice of reason. Of course, the public and our political leaders must be willing to listen. There needs to be greater awareness and greater of and respect for <coughs> scientists and the role of science in resolving critical national and international issues. And so it requires the scientific community to engage, and it requires an acceptance and even a desire for that engagement. Forty-three years ago this month, President John F. Kennedy made one of his most famous speeches, his special message to Congress on urgent national needs. He proposed, among other things, a renewed focus on scientific achievement and set a goal to land men on the moon by the end of the 1960s. In the wake of that speech, our country made a national commitment to advance science in general and the fledgling space program in particular. This effort inspired, assisted, and launched many of my generation into science, engineering, and mathematics. The scientific, technological, and economic benefits which that commitment engendered reached well beyond the legacy of the space program. A wealth of advances from that and like efforts came to the fore. Again, to pick a, one example, which is ubiquitous, the internet, the transformative technology upon which we rely almost entirely today is the product of a late 1960s Defense Department research initiative. This development occurred against the backdrop of the Cold War. And we live in a different time today. The Cold War, us versus them, climate has evolved and globalization has created a more complex, interdependent environment where major threats and opportunities are not just rooted in nations, but in loose groupings of like-minded individuals. And yet, President Kennedy's reference to American leadership remains relevant. The United States alone has been a world leader, but the continuation of that leadership is at stake today. We are in danger of finding ourselves without sufficient science and engineering talent to maintain it. Today's challenge is no longer just an opponent from without, but a challenge from within. President Kennedy's speech challenged the United States to invest, to invest in areas that would make a difference. He made it clear that it would not be easy to meet the substantial scientific and other challenges. That to achieve our goals would require real commitment and investment. He said, and I quote, I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary, but the facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. Think about it. This speech and his leadership in this arena marked the beginning of a period when the nation made a substantial 
investment in those resources, enabling the nation to enhance its mantle of leadership through its strength in science and technology. To secure the needed national commitment today will require strong leadership at the highest levels. But it also will require a coalition leadership, combining the science communities, education communities, corporate and industrial sectors, and the full spectrum of government. To secure this national commitment will require that the scientific and technological community focus its attention and energies on solutions to the difficult challenges to help find common ground solutions. To secure this national commitment will require a strengthened communication to inform public policy and to inform the public. Forty-three years ago, President Kennedy's confidence, optimism, and vision pushed the nation forward into a new age, an age of comfort, health, prosperity, leadership, sustained standard of living, and ultimately global preeminence, second to none. With no less urgency than President Kennedy displayed in 1961, and with just as much enthusiasm, we must press this issue forward. In urging Congress to make a national commitment to succeed in space, President Kennedy warned that while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first. We can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us last. We read it again. <laughs> While we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us last. How prescient his words sound as we today consider a national commitment to sustain our national capacity for innovation. Are we listening? Thank you very much. five minutes or so for questions. Uh, let me uh, ask, if I may, impose upon you Dr. Dorothy Zinberg, who is the, the person here at the school who has studied these matters most closely, to have a, a first question, please. Dorothy. I'm prepared, as I am. Um, I cannot believe that we haven't met in the past. Wait until you hear my history. I'll do it very briefly. But in the 50s, I was working at Harvard Medical School on one of the first studies ever done on radioactive isotopes and the transmission of radioactive chromium across membranes. But I got increasingly interested in the whole issue of the politics and psychology of science and began to study why do people like me drop out of science. And from that has sprung a career. As you were talking, I was thinking, we're really talking about a cultural shift, not just fixing one thing or another. I mean, everything you said is absolutely right. But how to make changes. If you look at an, an, any analysis of how scientists and engineers are pictured in movies and TV, they're mad. You know, as Margaret Mead wrote, they're smart, but you certainly wouldn't want your daughter to marry one of them. Uh, if you look at India, the role of the scientist and engineer, very high status not so in this country. I just couldn't help going over all of these things because they fitted in with what you are doing so well. Uh, if you look at the history in high schools, almost all physics departments have closed down. Nobody's taking physics anymore. You're lucky if you get kids to take a biology course. The NSF summer camps, which took gifted young scientists, got them to the next step, gone. That was a gone. Uh, we certainly haven't thought about women's life cycles enough about how the years that scientists tend to be most productive, exactly the years of women are having children, very hard to drop out of science and come back in. Even in the IT today, where women have not been disadvantaged, they're not in the engineering of it, they're not even thinking about the architecture of space, so we've sort of lost control of what the future of that will be. Uh, but let me just end with this because you're, you're you're talking about Kennedy, reminded me of the role of the science advisor. Jerry Wiesner was a potent force 
in all the things that Jack Kennedy did about science. Marburger today doesn't even have the title of science advisor, and what he's saying is really gone off to the winds. So you have given us all the tasks that we have to perform, but how are we going to take the next step uh, without a strong science leader in Washington? It's going to be really tough. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a great pleasure to your work. Thank you. I'm uh, so delighted to be able to speak here today is that the case for the importance of science to the resolution of important issues, both domestically and globally, clearly requires the weighing in of the scientific community, and that's a, an argument that I make. But the scientific community alone cannot uh, make that case if for no other reason than it begins to sound self-serving, at least in the minds of some. But here you are, all who are engaged in public leadership, uh, either in the doing, the eventual doing, and the study. And really, I think it is helpful if the communities can be joined in making that case, because I agree with you about the, the uh, status of the science advisor over the years. And, but that, I, you heard me say that the public uh, political leaders have to be able to accept the role of science and scientists in resolving issues. And I think uh, the kind of uh, point you made is very important. Governments had one article in its 293 dealing with diversity and gender. By 1985, there was a tech and tools tent that celebrated women innovators and women in science and technology. By 95, the pavilion of women had 20,000. And now on the edge of uh, the 2005 UNESCO report, I wrote with Sandra Harding a chapter on diversity and gender in science for the World Science Report and worked with David Gergen at the Center for Public Leadership on diversity and gender in the pipeline. And my question to you is, with the presence of the Women's Leadership Board at the shoulder and the elbow of the leaders of the Belfort Center and the Center for Public Leadership and Women in Public Policy, we have a remarkable opportunity to foster the attention to diversity and to gender in the science and technology as the missing element of the sharp edge of the knife of innovation to which you speak. And I would love to have your reflections on why it is important to ask different questions and in the social adjudication and the ethical reflection of the sciences and technologies we create, why that diverse voice provides and sheds such a magnificent set of new dimensions that are critical to the way and the path forward. It might just be the magnet that attracts that diversity into the sciences and brings those figures to where we imagine and visualize they can be. And know that the Women's Leadership Board has a, a fine weight by the edge of those of you who are in the institutions wishing to crack the issue. Let me try to give a very brief answer uh, going on two things. Uh, a, couple, a few years ago, approximately five, uh, I went to a meeting in South Africa sponsored by uh, our own National Science Foundation and the counterpart, or the closest counterpart of that organization in South Africa, which drew scientists, material scientists in particular, from all over Sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, you know, the scientists from the U.S. got up and gave a standard uh, American Physical Society type of uh, presentations on great research in material science and, and engineering. But in the end, the point that our hosts and others from Sub-Saharan Africa made was that the kinds of materials with which we are accustomed to working, that we expect to use to address um, infrastructure issues to advance, to create technological advancement, were not those that were available and in, in many of those countries and or in, and in the short term would not be available in the sense of being able to import certain kinds of materials. And therefore, the definition of what material science is takes on a different meaning. Not to mention 
uh, cultural norms about the use or non-use of certain kinds of materials. A second, which I think relates more to your point, uh, has to do with having the essential voice of uh, women because particularly in areas that relate to health care and so much in the world relates to people's health in terms of their ability to have uh, economic uh, prosperity. It is women who are on the, the, the leading edge of being able in an observational way to understand the impact not only of scientific modalities but of old uh, approaches to treatment in terms of people's acceptance of various kinds of things, as well as the balance of alternative medicine strategies with the kind of, let's call it synthetic medicine strategies that the West really uh, focuses a lot on. So I think both of these are, in my mind, uh, examples of why we need diverse voices. We have lots of people who want to ask questions, but I, we do need to, as I understand it, about uh, five more minutes, says, says the boss. And therefore, since she's given the microphone to someone, uh, uh, I have no choice. He's a student of mine. He'll do fine. Go ahead. Steve. I have a quick question. Um, uh, you focus a lot on encouraging diverse talent in science and technology. Um, if, if the president were to ask you today, what would be the five recommendations on, on if you were the chairman of a policy on national policy for, for sustaining innovation in, in the U.S.? What would be the five recommendations? Um, one is to strengthen uh, math and science-based education beginning in the uh, uh, primary schools, but particularly intervening no later than in middle, middle school to ensure a certain baseline level of preparation and achievement uh, in that arena. The second is to give real meaning to tapping the complete talent pool and developing not only academic intervention strategies, but strategies that look to mentor and encourage uh, young women and underrepresented groups uh, in, uh, to pursue life careers. The third is to recreate something like the kind of special focused uh, fellowships and incentives for graduate study, for advanced study, that uh, existed uh, in the 1960s. The fourth is the investment that I talked about in fundamental research, and it has to go on at a deeper and broader level uh, than today. And the fifth is to articulate that we need not fear globalization. We just have to be sure that we have our own uh, perspectives and maintain our capabilities. You know, it reminds me, I'm going to date myself, you probably are too young to relate to this, but I'll tell the story. You know, when I was growing up, uh, kids used to play marbles. Now, you know, the girls didn't play all the time, but I did. And so you would have your little, you know, jar or bag or whatever of marbles, and you could go out and play every day for a long time. But if you lost all the time, and you ended up with no marbles. <laughs> you couldn't play. <laughs> We're talking about making sure we have a few marbles to play. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, I have a very practical question. Tomorrow I go and address 650 people. It's called Multicultural People and Technology for a multi billion dollar global company that's in technology. I'll be talking to them about authentic diversity and the importance of them raising their hand and providing that opportunity for the company to grow in innovation and ultimately prosperity. What is the corporate responsibility level? They'll be thinking about profitability and sustained profitability. Is that where the question of the responsibility comes in? Because for the company, who's the leader on the globe? How much are they invested in that? For publicly held companies, the leader is the shareholder base. And uh, in a capitalist society, and I think it has worked quite well for us, um, companies are going to look at uh, profitability or return to shareholders. And I think in making then arguments relative to the value of diversity, one has to make that linkage between diversity and what a company is in business for. But I would argue to you that many of the globally focused companies themselves already value diversity because they understand uh, that to compete, they need the different voice 
and perspective that was talked about earlier, and that they need to develop uh, those who can be global leaders. That actually puts a challenge on universities in terms of how we educate our young people. Do we actually educate them for global leadership? And I think it's a discussion that, that uh, presidents and faculty uh, need to have so much more than occurs today. Dr. Jackson, first of all, it's obvious you won all the marbles. <laughs> uh, for some of you who don't know, I used to work in the United States Senate many years ago. And I remember distinctly a time where the senator asked me to work on a gun control legislation in the early 70s. And I said to him, we're going to lose. Nobody's going to suggest that any money will be spent on this. And, he's, and I asked him why he wanted me to work on it, and he said, this is the right thing to do. Basic uh, scientific research also sounds like it's the best thing to do for us and humanity. But isn't it true that historically much money has gone into basic research in response to a threat or a problem or a disaster? Exactly. And is it more likely that a catastrophic event may trigger some of the basic research? And if not, how do you expect uh, a government that has shallow and short resources to spend the money on basic research such as this administration. Thank you for raising the question. This is what I actually believe. I think that is a challenge for us. I think we have what we would call a, a creeping catastrophe as opposed to a sudden catastrophe. With that, it is very difficult to get the attention of, of, uh, of political and, and other leaders. But I know you may know about the initiative undertaken by the Council on Competitiveness on uh, National Innovation, which is being um, led by uh, Sam Palmasano, uh, Chairman and CEO of IBM. Uh, the co-chair is uh, Wayne Clough from Georgia Tech, and then I'm uh, on the Committee of Principals with other university presidents and CEOs. I actually think it's going to take uh, that kind of a, a focus and uh, groundswell to make the case uh, in the absence of some catastrophe which clearly links uh, our uh, innovation capacity to our national security. At the same time, I actually do believe that the United States is competitive, you know, we're competitive people. And as more uh, of the kind of data that appeared in the New York Times article this morning, uh, comes to the fore about where we really stand uh, relative to other countries. And when the uh, uh, impact of that on some of our own uh, U.S. companies uh, comes into play, I think people will move. But we do face a challenge because it is a more complex environment. It's not just us against the Soviets. And it's always easier if one has one big, discreet adversary. Can I make one quick response? Please. Please. The, the hottest investment environment in NICS right now in the, in the world marketplace for venture capitalists is the security market. It speaks volumes. It's a, it's a security market that was never touched before. Had it been touched, we may not be in the situation we're in. Well, let me make a response to your response. And that is, <laughs> I want some of your marbles. <laughs> well, I only have cat eyes, and no one ever gets those. <laughs> My comment is this, that um, I shall have your marbles back. It's these marbles that I need. Um, because we have distributed threats, it is very hard to make the case to our leaders that we need some one big infusion of capital into the science and technology research enterprise. But if you really think about it, the scientists themselves are pretty uh, ingenious, not just in science, but in terms of how they garner and make use of money. And many scientists, and I probably would not make friends with some of my colleagues for saying this, many of us have argued the purity of science. <coughs> and in point of fact, many of these fundamental research uh, uh, discoveries and innovations 
came because the money did come through fairly directed programs or programs that linked to what were the perceived threats. So I've encouraged our own faculty to think broadly about the fact that we are where we are, that security, homeland security, national security is very important. But where are the fundamental questions within that whole overall rubric that they might address that are appropriate for universities? And I believe then uh, they can get support, at least in certain key areas. But they, we have to be willing to make the case. Surely I could listen to you all day. I don't know about you all, but I always have the same reaction listening to Shirley. In the first five minutes, you say to yourself, well, I wish I could speak like Shirley Jackson. And then about 20 minutes later, you say, well, I wish I could think like Shirley Jackson. And then by the end, it's I want to be like Shirley Jackson. Shirley, many, many thanks.